company that's, that's motivated by greed and avarice and profit that's picking up the pieces like many other players and outsmarting all of those players. Is it about personality? Because he's, an, he's got a number of very interesting characters in the book, from this very doomed and lonely emperor called Shah Alam, to uh, uh, you know, Begums who are drowned in the middle of the river, to uh, Robert Clive who's very clearly uh, mentally you know, not quite there, and a bunch of others. So it's also a play of personality, it's a play of timing really. It's a, there, there are these sensational battles, and William will probably tell you about his travels to some of these battlefields and important sites. Where, where these events unfolded. And altogether, at the end of it, you're left with some really interesting questions that you have to reflect on. For instance, you know, the East India Company is a profit-driven enterprise, and we are living in a time of Twitter and Facebook. You know, private companies that are trans-regional have very few things to regulate them, which are motivated by profit, and which are fundamentally altering the way democracy works. So is it a, is it a pattern we're seeing again, or is, is history repeating itself in some way? So these are the questions. Williams lost his voice somewhat, I think, uh, because of, a, of an unfortunate illness day before yesterday. But I'll hand over to him. He's got a wonderful presentation, at the end of which we'll take questions. Thank you. Could we have the first slide? And I must apologize for my voice, I'm afraid. I hope that it would make me sound sexier, but it just <laughs> makes me sound like a Dalek, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> One of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the word loot. Loot was a word unknown outside North India until in the mid 18th century it made a miraculous appearance in England uh, and became firmly rooted uh, in the language. And if you want to know why, you could do a lot worse than to visit this uh, imposing castle on the Anglo-Welsh marches. This is Powys, uh, where the Clive family married into and where a lot of the Clive's loot from India ended up. From the outside, it couldn't look more English. You've got a, a castle rising above um, Jersey cows, uh, chomping the cud below then Tudor box edges. But go inside the turret at the front and you come across a very different world. Inside this castle, there are room after room of Mughal treasures, more Mughal treasures, in fact, or more Indo-Islamic treasures uh, than are in any one existing collection in India. There are swords and shields and helmets, elephant armor, Hindu statuary, and one or two quite major items of, of historic importance at the front here were looking through the, the palanquin of Siraj Daula left on the battlefield of Plassey in 1757. If you go through the arch at the left-hand corner of this slide, uh, you enter the campaign tent of Tipu Sultan, where uh, Tipu Sultan planned all his campaigns and in which he lived during all his battles and campaigns. What is all this doing in the middle of Wales? Well, the answer can be found on a painting which you have to pass underneath to get into the treasure chambers, into the khazanas. It's not a very good painting. It was by a man who never went to India. It's entirely a fantasy uh, by Benjamin West. Even at the time when it was first shown at the Royal Academy, one critic pointed out that the dome in the background looked more like our own venerable dome of St. Paul's than anything Indian. But what it shows is crucially important. In the center of the picture, you have a Mughal prince in cloth of gold handing a legal document to a slightly overweight, powdered and periwigged English gentleman. Now, what is happening there is a transaction that would not only change the entire history of Britain and India, but also the relationship of Europe and Asia. Up to this point, since antiquity, money had flowed from Europe to India. 
Pliny, in the first century, complains that uh, rich Roman women have a taste for diamonds from India, that they want to rub Indian sandalwood on their bodies, that they want to wear silk from India, as a result of which gold drains from the Roman exchequer into the pockets of Indian merchants. This continued without a break up until this point. But in this document, which is given by Shah Alam to Robert Clive, the right to gather the taxes and run the economy and mint the coins of the three richest provinces of the Mughal Empire was handed not to the British state, but to one English company based in London in this building. It's not even the buildings on either side. It's not even the two tall buildings on the edge of the slide. It is just those five windows in the middle. When the Battle of Plassey is fought, that is where the East India Company is based. A century into its existence, the East India Company employed only 35 people in its head office. Never at any point did the East India Company send out more than 2,000 white Englishmen to, uh, uh, to Bengal. The ridiculous, audacious trick that this financial institution played was to borrow money from willing Indian financiers, particularly the Jagat Sets initially, but then other companies like Gopal Das and, and Allahabad and Patna and so on, and to then use that money to recruit Indian soldiers to fight their wars for them. They paid double the rate any Indian ruler paid. It was about money. But by doing that, in a series of, well, in as little as 50 years, in a series of encounters so improbable that if you were to write it as a novel, no one would believe you. In 50 years, using Indian troops to fight other Indians, paid for by Indian bankers, the company conquers the richest country in the world. Just to give you a, an idea of the, the incomprehensibility of this, when the company is founded in 1599, Britain, or England rather, because Britain does not yet exist, it is just England, contributes 3% to the world's gross, gross domestic product. The Mughal Empire produces just under 30% just under a third of the world's entire production. There is a tendency in India today to look on the Mughals as these effete tomb builders who waste the money of India, hanging out in harems with gorgeous women and building Taj Mahals, wherever. In a sense, people have always looked at the wrong thing. One of the most remarkable achievements of the Mughals was what they did for Indian industry and Indian exports. In the 17th century, for the first time since the classical period, India overtakes China as the world's leading industrial exporter. And most of what is being exported is coming out, perhaps surprisingly today, from Bengal. In Bengal, there are one million weavers. They make the world's greatest silk. They make the world's cheapest and finest cotton. The East India Company rises to riches shipping those textiles around the world. So much so that by the early 18th century, there's de-industrialization as far away as Mexico because of the mass imports of Indian cotton. So in the East India Company builds up its money taking Indian goods around the world. So we go back to the beginning. Where does this all begin? So we've just had the brilliant Stephen Greenblatt talk about Shakespeare. And it is in Shakespeare's London that the East India Company is founded, as Shakespeare is writing Hamlet. September 1599. Hamlet, I think, is produced for the first time in November 1599. But in September, this man calls a meeting in Moorgate Fields. This man is called Sir Thomas Smythe. He is, if you like, the VJ Malia of Elizabethan England. Uh, before the income tax people got him. And uh, 
Vijay Malia, I thought Vijay Malia, Thomas Smythe. <laughs> Thomas Smythe, like Vijay Malia, inherited a lot of money from his father, but quickly made more money. He um, founded, he made a first fortune in his 20s importing currants from the Greek islands to England. He then makes a second fortune by taking over the customs and creaming off um, a lot of the money from the London customs. Then he found something called the Levant Company with 30 other very rich merchants to buy spices from Venice, very much the same world as the merchant of Venice we were talking about last session, from Venice, from Aleppo, uh, and from uh, Cairo. But in the 1590s, five or six years into this company's existence, a catastrophic commercial blunder takes place because the Dutch realize that you can, don't have to go and buy the spices from the Arabs or from the Italians. You can just sail around the Cape of Good Hope, go directly to Indonesia, buy the spices from the producer at a fraction of the cost, and then sell them in Europe. And the Dutch do this, and suddenly, Smythe finds that his business has got no, uh, can't even begin to compete. His, his spices are old. They've been uh, hanging around on sort of, you know, camels in the Sinai Desert for months. Uh, they don't smell good, and they're very expensive. So what does he do? He calls a public meeting, and he invites everyone. And this is the crucial thing he does, because he doesn't just go to his 30 friends who, who helped establish the Levant Company, the 30 richest merchants in, in London. Instead, he opens it up to everyone. There's a meeting at the uh, Founders Hall, it's called, in Moorgate Fields, about 20 minutes' walk north of where Shakespeare is writing Hamlet. And he, these are the names of the people that attend the meeting. The East India Company, from the very beginning, kept every chit, every document, every list. This is literally the list of people, as they walk into the meeting, the money that they're giving. And the first at the top says he's going to donate 200 pounds. The one second guy on the list is donating 1,000. The next is giving 300. And it goes on for 15 pages until by the kind of page 10, you're getting little mum and pop businesses with people giving seven shillings or three pounds or two pounds. Because what Smythe did was he relied on a new business idea that had only been tried three times before. And this was something called the joint stock company. Something totally ordinary today something most people in the audience uh, will have worked for at some point in their life, but a brand new and revolutionary idea in Elizabethan London. And the idea is that unlike, say, a family business, like Marco Polo's business or the Medici Bank, where it's a bunch of cousins pooling their capital and trading, or unlike, say, a guild, where a bunch of Suffolk merchants pool their capital and go and trade in Bruges or the Low Countries, Unlike that, a joint stock company means that anyone can put in money. One pound, ten pounds, a hundred pounds, a thousand pounds, like the second person on the list. They don't have to get involved in any way in the running of the business. They don't have to go anywhere. But they do get a share of the profits. And this idea tried once or twice before, first time in something called the Muscovy Company, fourth time with the East India Company. This is an idea that will revolutionize the world. Because from this moment, companies have the capacity to pull in an unlimited seam of investment. Anyone can invest in the East India Company, which means that its ability to grow is almost unlimited. So having had this meeting, having got all the, the money, they then go and buy a ship. They put this guy in charge, not necessarily a good idea since Sir James Lanchester had just sunk the ship on the left of his portrait uh, uh, the, the year before, going, trying to get to the Moluccas to buy spices. In fact, all his sailors had been eaten by cannibals, and no one had come back alive except him. But he was the only guy in England that knew the way, so he still gets the job. Uh, and he goes off, and he goes to Deptford docks. The first ship he looks at is a creaky old hulk called the Mayflower. Uh, which they reject as being unsaleable, and it disappears from history and is never heard of again. <laughs> the second ship they, they look at, which they then buy, uh, is a pirate ship. It's called, and I'm not making this up, the Scourge of Malice. It, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of Jack Sparrow's flagship. 
And luckily, they, 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 they're bright enough to realize they better rename it, so they call it the Red Dragon, as if it's a country pub in the Welsh countryside or something. <laughs> and off they sail. And they only get as far as Dover when the wind stops. It's, it's, it's not uh, sailing season. And they get becalmed off the coast of Dover. And everyone goes and has a picnic on the White Cliffs and waves at them and makes fun of them. And they all say, this lot will never get anywhere. But eventually the wind does pick up. They do cross the Cape. And to their own surprise, they make it to the East Indies, where just as they're about to arrive at the Spice Island of Run, they see a Portuguese ship coming in the opposite direction full of spices. And as they're all ex-pirates, they simply board the Portuguese ship, put all the contents into their hold, and sail back to England. <laughs> they sell the spices for one million pounds. And this is enough to ex in completely revolutionize the, uh, everything in, in London. The East India Company is there. But for 30 years, they, they struggle. Because ultimately, the Dutch, who started before them, who have better ships, and certainly better captains than Sir James Lanchester, um, are always ahead of them. They've got deeper pockets, better banks. And eventually, rather like a, a modern startup, an internet startup that has to slightly re, you know, refocus itself after its first five years, they say, hang on, this isn't working. And for, they give over the right to trade the spices to the Dutch. And there's a swap which takes place. And the spice island of rum, where all the world's nutmeg comes from, is handed over to the Dutch. In return, the British get some muddy island in the Hudson River in America um, called Manhattan, uh, which also turns out to be a rather good investment in the long term. But so they refocus. And by the 1630s, they focus not on the East Indies, but on India. And it's good timing, because 1630, Shah Jahan's on the throne, the Mughal Empire's at its peak, and all that sort of Mughal aesthetic, which, which has uh, resulted in the Taj and the Padshah Nama, also has resulted in incredibly fine textile production in Bengal. And it is the company that trades this stuff and which ships it around the world. So they make the right commercial decision at this point, and they grow on the back of Mughal exports. And as the Mughals grow to be the world's largest industrial producers, so the company grow to be the world's biggest shippers, shipping Indian goods around the world. And all goes well until, and they buy a new headquarters in Leadenhall Street. They build their own docks at Deptford, where they start making all these ships. All goes well until Aurangzeb overexpands the Mughal Empire, and you get the, the, the beginnings of this anarchy. The, the Marathas rise up in the Maratha homelands, they burn Surat, the Sikhs rise up in the Punjab, the Jats rise up in the Doab, and in the middle is sitting Delhi. Delhi, the largest city in the world at that point, a million people, full of all the loot that had been gathered from around India, and before that by the Sultans. Rich, rich city. Who is going to get it? Is it going to be the Marathas? Possibly, is it going to be the Jats? In the end, it's none of them. This is Chani Chak. Look how gorgeous Chani Chak was. It's this guy, Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah is the son of a man who makes fur hats. Very humble background. He rises by sheer military merit to be the generalissimo of the Safavid army in Persia. He then performs a military coup, overthrows the Safavid Shah, and in order to get some money, decides to raid India. He has no intention of conquering India. What he wants is cash to fight his real enemies, who are the Russians and the Turks, the Ottomans. So he says, he says I will go and pluck some golden feathers from the Mughal peacock's tail. And that's what he does. He goes in, he takes Kabul, he takes Kandahar, no resistance. So he goes down the Khyber Pass, he takes Peshawar, and he takes Lahore. And at that point, Mohammed Shah Rangila in Delhi wakes up and gathers what will be one of the largest armies in Indian history. 1.5 million men gather. Nizam al Mulk comes up from uh, Hyderabad, uh, Sadat Ali Khan comes from Avad, and these three armies mass at Karnal, north of Delhi. The trouble is that the whole of, sort of you know, the, the 17th century equivalent of, 18th century equivalent of, of Khan Market turns up too. Every Dior sunglassy and, sel and selfie taking socialite in Delhi, dancing girls, and it's a huge sort of party going on in the Mughal camp. 
Meanwhile, in the Persian camp, there's just 160,000 battle-trained troops armed with the new military gizmo of the time, which is called the swivel gun. You mount it on a camel or a horse, on a tripod, and it fires an enormous slug that can pierce any Mughal armor. The Mughals don't know about this. They allow themselves to be, well, Nadia Shah lures the Mughals out of their encampment, and they line up over six miles on the plains of Karnal. This extraordinary last cavalry charge. They're all there in their, in their horse armor, glittering in the sunlight, into a trot, into a canter, finally into a gallop. And at the last minute, the light Persian cavalry parts like a curtain, and there in front of them are these line of swivel guns. Two minutes later, it's all over. The cream of Mughal chivalry lie dead on the ground. And that evening, Nadir Shah on the right invites Mohammed Shah Rangila on the left to dinner in the camp. And the idiot goes, taking dancing girls and a band and only a few bodyguards. And of course, after dinner, Nadia Shah merely disarms the bodyguards, arrests the emperor, and the next day they march into Delhi together with, with uh, Nadia Shah riding behind Muhammad Shah Rangila on his own elephant. Six weeks later, they leave Delhi. Nadia Shah leaves Delhi with 8,000 wagons filled with all the gold, jewels, silver, loot that they'd gathered. The Peacock Throne, the Kohinoor, the Daryanoor, the other Mughal thrones, they're all taken, and the whole lot taken off to Herat. In one go, it's as if all the fuel that had powered the Mughal boiler was extinguished overnight. And the effect was like, imagine you take a big Baroque mirror and you throw it from a second-hand, second-story window. It lies, smashes on the ground. That's what happens to the Mughal Empire. Without any money to pay the army, without any money to pay the civil service, the whole thing shatters and fragments into a hundred states. Culturally, this is a great period. Jodhpur, Jaipur, Udaipur, everyone begins to build new palaces. There's wonderful painting going on in Guler, in Jasrota, the Tanjo. Suddenly, all these states, released from having to give taxes to the Mughal exchequer, start building incredible creativity. But politically, India has never been weaker. Because what was one single state with four million men under arms is now a patchwork of tiny little states which are militarily vulnerable. And this becomes apparent very quickly. Now this lot may look like a sort of gay pride parade, but actually, <laughs> but this is the latest cutting edge military technology from Europe. These are the, these charming, uh, short-wearing, only the French would make their sepoys dress in, in natty little shorts like this. But uh, this, these guys um, are, have, since while the whole unraveling of uh, after Aurangzeb's reign has been going on in, in India, in Europe, Frederick the Great has been reinventing warfare. Socket bayonets on muskets, infantry maneuvers, Horse cavalry moved around the battlefield with 18th century ballistics being used to put shells accurately into enemy formations. Warfare has been very quickly um, revolutionized. And the French are the first to realize that if you can train up a bunch of Scotsmen to do this, you can certainly train up a bunch of Tam Brams. So they, so they, get, they, they recruit a whole load of uh, Tamil and Andhra sepoys, Telugu sepoys. And they put 7,000 of them, 700, sorry, 700 Telugu sepoys into battle against 30,000 Carnatic Mughal cavalry. And in 1741, at the Battle of the Adyar River, the Mughal cavalry are routed. And suddenly you have this period of about 25 years when the two European companies, the Compagnie des Indes de France and the East India Company of Britain, have the, have the military ability to defeat any army. By 1770, both the Marathas and Tupu Sultan have caught up because the, 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 the new military techniques are not rocket science. And French, um, French mercenaries teach Indian armies how to do this stuff, but it takes about 20, 25 years for this technology to pass. And in that time, the companies make huge change to the map of India. The first to feel the heat is Siraj Daula of Bengal. Siraj Daula is not the hero that you read about in your history textbooks. He's actually a really nasty little punk. 
He's, uh, he's, 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 according to his own cousin, he's a serial bisexual rapist uh, whose idea of fun was to sink pleasure boats uh, in, the, in the Ganges and watch the people um, uh, drown. He's very aggressive. He takes over, he decides to take over Calcutta um, when he hears that, the, uh, that the, the company, to defend itself against the French, as another war with France is about to break out, the company uh, rearms and refortifies Calcutta. When he hears this, that they've done this without his permission, he goes and attacks Calcutta and takes it. But sadly for him, the timing is not right. Because the same day that the news of the fall of Calcutta arrives in Madras, this man turns up with a Royal Navy fleet. This is Robert Clive, also a particularly nasty piece of work. Uh, he, uh, he, as a child, he'd run protection rackets in his hometown of Market, Drayton, threatening to throw stones through the shopkeeper's windows if they didn't pay him protection money. Even at one point, as a teenager, lies down in front of a gutter and, and channels the, the sewage into someone's shop who hasn't paid him off. And he takes this sort of incredibly aggressive spirit to India with him. And he's come out with a Royal Navy fleet because some dodgy intelligence, just like the Iraq war started because of the false intelligence about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. So this fleet has arrived in India looking for a phantom French fleet, which a spy's report has said has just sailed for India. In fact, that fleet sailed for Canada in the opposite direction. But the Navy sends out an entire fleet to, to Madras. On arrival, they find there's nothing for them to do, and then they hear this news that Calcutta has fallen. So they just sail north. They retake Calcutta. They then reduce Chandanagar, the French port, to ashes. Completely destroyed Chandanagar. And they're just about to return to Madras, just in case the French do turn up, when a crucial letter arrives from Murshidabad. And the person who sent it is the Jagat Set. Now, the Jagat Set is the richest banker in India. He's a Mawari from Jodhpur, whose, answer, whose grandfather had settled in Murshidabad. And they'd invented various very clever financial mechanisms for moving money around India. In the old days, at the time, at the time of Aurangzeb, the governor of Bengal would have to have sent wagons filled with gold up the road through Avad to Delhi to pay his, to pay his tribute. But the Jagat says, says no problem, sir. All you do is you pay the money into my office in Murshidabad, and you can withdraw it from my office in Delhi. I'll take 10%, thank you. <laughs> and he then takes 10% on the coinage and minting, and soon, according to the East India Company, money flows into the Jagat Set's treasury, like money flows into, uh, from the Ganges into the sea. And this guy had fallen out with Siraj Daula. Siraj Daula had threatened him with circumcision if he didn't give a loan that he didn't want to give. And he slaps him in court. Now, the threat of circumcision is enough to make most men concentrate a little bit. <laughs> and certainly the Jagat said, says, you know, this is unacceptable. And he writes to Clive, whose military power is just seen taking Calcutta, d destroying Chandanagar. And he says, look, it's very simple. Come up to Mashidabad. I will give you personally two million pounds sterling if you take Murshidabad and I will give the company two million too. Overthrow Siraj Daula and we can make another guy, Mir Jaffa, the new Nawab. Clive says, fair enough, sir, no problem at all. He doesn't even check with London or Madras, he just goes up and does it. And the Battle of Plassey, which years of imperial history tells as this great imp heroic imperial episode, is a setup because Mir Jaffa is also in the pay of the Jagat Set too. So they fight the battle halfway through, Jagat Set just with, uh, sorry, uh, Mir Jaffa withdraws his troops, Siraj Daula flees the battlefield, leaving that palanquin behind him, and his, he's eventually caught, and his body, hacked to bits, is displayed through Mashidabad. The next day, Clive just goes into the treasury and he helps himself, he fills his pockets. He then fills 40 barges, with the contents of the Mashidabad treasury and just sails it, punts it down river to Fort William, Calcutta. Just runs off with her lot. Later, when he's asked by Parliament what right he had to do all this, he had no orders to take Mashidabad. This was completely his own initiative. He, why did he take the money from the Jagat Sets? 
Uh, and, wh and why did he help himself to everything in the treasury? He answers, my lords, I was astonished by my own moderation. <laughs> anyway, the, this victory gives the company confidence. People can see their power now. Seven years later, there's another battle at the Battle of Buxar, uh, when they defeat not just uh, the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam sitting here on the ground, but also uh, Mir Qasim, the new Nawab of Bengal, and um, uh, Shuja Daula, the giant uh, Nawab of Avad. And at that point, suddenly, the company realizes that it's got the whole of North India at its feet. It's 1764, and this is the point that the Diwani is signed, that picture we saw at the beginning. That document changes the pattern of trade for the next 150 years, where previously the company had had to import large quantities of European gold and silver in order to buy goods from India. India didn't want anything Britain. They didn't want tweed from Scotland or, uh, you know, I don't know, fish and chips or fried Mars bars or anything else. It, it just wanted the gold. But now, once you have the company controlling the diwani, the right to mint, the right to tax, money begins to flow in the opposite direction. It's like a switch has been turned. And money begins to leave India in vast quantities. Sometimes a company official retiring to England takes one million pounds. Sometimes he takes 10. Sometimes he takes 15. And this is the period when suddenly, if you go to England on your summer holidays and you see all those gorgeous National Trust properties that all look as if Colin Firth is about to stride out of them in his wet breeches, that's when these buildings are built. They're built with money from here. They're also built with money from the slave trade and in the Caribbean. Those are the two sources of English wealth at this period. And it turns England from a minor player on the edge of Europe into the world's leading economy by the mid-18th century and right through to the mid-19th century. It's your money taken by the East India Company, one company, which builds those houses. The company grows. At the time of Plassey, there are 10,000 Indian sepoys employed by the company. That grows to 20, 40, 100. By 1799, the company has the largest modern army in Asia. 200,000 trained, paid Indian sepoys, all lined up neatly in a row. It's twice the size of the British army, but it's not a national army. It is owned by one company, answerable only to the shareholders and the directors. It, tax collectors from the company now fan out across India and begin assessing land and collecting taxes. They realize that you can grow opium in Bihar and, and Bengal. So they start planting opium. They sell it in China illegally because the Chinese no more want opium flooding their country than Mr. Trump wants crack cocaine coming in from Colombia. But the East India Company's scale of operations look, makes the Medellin cartel look like child play. These are the biggest narcos in the world. Uh, and it's far, far bigger than anything since. With that money that they make in Hong Kong, they buy tea, which they ship to India, which they ship to Europe, and they ship to America. It's, this is the Boston Tea Party. It's East India Company tea that is being poured into Boston Harbor. And so here you have now, in a very short time, the world's first multinational company that straddles the globe. For the first time, you have a corporation which is richer than a nation state and which can threaten a nation state. And not only is it threatening states in India, one by one dismantling Tipu, then the Marathas, and so on. In England, it's corrupting the body politic because the East India Company is the first corporation that realizes that you can bribe MPs. In 1697, they're caught handing brown paper envelopes to, uh, to, the, to MPs. And there's a big trial. The governor of the East India Company goes to the, uh, goes to the Tower of London, along with the Lord Privy Councillor. They invent corporate lobbying. They realize that, uh, that uh, parliaments, magnificent as they are, run on, uh, on, on parties, and parties run on donations. So the uh, whole idea, the whole culture of corporate financing of political parties, of corporate donations, of lobbying of parliaments, everything that goes on in, uh, in, White, in, in the White House, or in Washington, in London, but also here, the Tatars, the Adanis, all these guys, pouring money into political parties. That culture is invented by the company. 
So the idea that you can have a corporation which is owned by its shareholders, which is more powerful than a nation state. Today, for example, ExxonMobil. You'll see their lovely adverts all over the, uh, uh, the airport uh, in, in Delhi, uh, how they're going to make a green future. ExxonMobil, if it was a country, would be the 10th richest country in the world. So these giant corporations straddling the globe start here. The East India Company has a flag, which of course is then borrowed by some minor country north of South America. To, uh, <laughs> it has a whole new co uh, uh, corporate headquarters that spreads up Leadenhall Street. The director's boardroom is the racecourse road of its day, where all the decisions about India are made by a bunch of merchants sitting in London. It builds half the London docks. It builds 170 clippers a year to put opium, uh, silks, and, uh, and tea around the world. But, like modern corporations, the company is vulnerable because it depends on its share price. The company, as soon as it's got Bengal, Bihar, and Arissa, it begins to asset strip it. No one is regulating it. They control the right of who comes out from London to look at, the, uh, to, 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 to look at India. So you can't have investigative journalists coming out and seeing what they're up to in Bengal because the company will not give them passports. The government gets about half its customs and half its tax from the company. So they're not looking too much at where the money's coming from. But the company, unregulated, unsupervised, Asset strips Bengal. They turn the richest province of the Mughal Empire in as little as six years into a dust bowl. And it's, it, it's a, it, it, it kills, effectively, the golden goose that's laying the, 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 goose that's laying the golden eggs. 1770, so badly have they asset stripped Bengal, only six years after the Battle of Buxar, that when the rains fail, 1.5 million Bengalis die. The company does not set up a soup kitchen, it does not set up a single um, famine relief measure because the company is just about making money, just like Goldman Sachs is just about making money. No one joins Goldman Sachs because of its corporate responsibility program. You join it because you want to make money. This is the same with the East India Company. They don't care if Bengalis are starving. So what do they do? They send out the, the army. They send the sepoys into the countryside. In addition to all the bodies now clogging the Ganges and corpses being eaten in the streets of Calcutta, they set up gibbets. And if anyone doesn't pay them the full taxes, they swing from the gibbet. The shareholders in London, when they hear that despite a major famine and one million deaths, when they hear that taxes have been gathered in full, they, vote, uh, they, uh, they make a vote of thanks to the company and they raise the dividend from 10% to 12.5%. The next year, the same happens. But the third year, there is no more to gather. Even if they hang everyone that's still alive, there's no more money in Bengal. It's all dead. It's all gone. And so when the news comes that the company has managed to raise no revenue that year, the company's share price goes into tailspin. First one, then two, then seven. Eventually, 30 banks collapse across Europe. It's like the subprime, but much worse. But the difference is that unlike Lehman Brothers, the company is too big to fail because it's generating half the British economy. It's, employing a, it's the biggest single employer in the country. It's certainly the biggest payer of taxes and the biggest payer of customs. So the, company has to, the country has to bail out the company to the tune of an unprecedented four million pounds. Uh, and this, this goes on. And so the com for the first time in 1774, the state takes an interest in the East India Company. And from that point, it becomes, I suppose, what you might call it moves from being an un, uh, 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 unrestrained, pure, libertarian capitalism at its most ruthless to what we'd probably call today a public-private partnership. And government control increases from that time. So that eventually, by 1857, when the company screws up and the great uprising breaks up, 1857 takes place, at the end of that, the company is actually effectively nationalized by the British state, and it becomes a state enterprise. But what's extraordinary is that we have forgotten the corporate element in all this. In your textbooks and in British textbooks, the story of the British in India is a state enterprise. In reality, the Raj which lasts only from 1858 to 1947, 90 years, a blink in the eye of Indian history, is far smaller than the period between 1599, when the company is founded, 
1857, which is 250 years. And yet somehow we've forgotten this period. We've forgotten this corporate period. And it's very important that we remember it. Because it's far worse to be governed by a corporation than by a government. The, we'll get on to Warren Hastings in a second. We'll just quickly move forward to 18, 1857, the Great Uprising. Around, in the aftermath, around 100,000 innocent Indians are killed between Delhi, Lucknow, and Kanpur. A million times bigger massacres than Julian Wallabug. Uh, but rarely remembered today. And even Parliament wakes up at this point and realizes this can't go on. So the company is nationalized. And just as they hear reports of the company blowing sepoys from the mouths of cannon, so in this punch cartoon, you have India House. You can just see behind the cannon, India House being blown up. And no one is mourning it. Here are the signs, nepotism, blundering, avarice, and misgovernment. But it's very important to remember this history because just as the 19th century British span history to turn this into a nationalist story of imperial triumph, and just as Indian nationalist historians reversed that into a story of national oppression followed by one of national liberation, we've forgotten the corporate element in this story. The East India Company was a corporation. And today, at a period when we have these massive corporations like ExxonMobil, like Facebook, like Google, with resources greater than many nation states, it's very important to remember this. In 1953, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company um, persuaded the CIA to overthrow Mossadegh, the first and only elected um, uh, government in Iran, uh, because he was planning to nationalize the oil industry. Two years later, United Fruit persuade, persuade the CIA in 1955 to topple the elected government in Guatemala, again because it's a socialist government that's threatening land redistribution. United Fruit, who own the bananas, um, own 42% of the agricultural land in Guatemala in 1955. The CIA overthrows them, and the phrase Banana Republic is born. 1977, ITT don't like Salvador Allende's government in Chile. They get the CIA to overthrow him, and you get the um, you get the most hideous dictatorship in Latin American history in uh, uh, in Chile to follow it. In each one of these, it's corporate lobbying that has brought down a national government. Today, Facebook and Google do not have infantry regiments. They don't have the equivalent of the East India Company's armies of uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear submarines. But they're listening to every word that we're saying. If you've got your phones on now, you'll start getting in your social media feed tomorrow morning or even later on this afternoon adverts for East India Company tea. Uh, uh, <laughs> And, they, uh, and so they're listening to everything they say. Surveillance capitalism is a reality, and it's very, very powerful. We're running out of time, but I'm going to take you back to, quickly to Warren Hastings here. Warren Hastings is the one time that the company actually gets put on trial by, the, uh, by Parliament. Hastings, who's actually by far the most benign of all the governor judges, far, far uh, more interesting and, and sophisticated character than Clive. Um, Hastings knows Bengali and Persian. He tries to live his life according to the uh, various sutras of the Gita and so on. But it's he who takes the rap, and he's called in front of Parliament. And I'm just going to end today with what the Lord Chancellor says to uh, Hastings as he stands at the bar uh, in the, during the impeachment. And he says, my lords, corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do as they like. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, following such an excellent presentation with questions is, again, a very thankless task because he's already covered most of the fun stuff. But there's two things I'll ask before we open, to the, open up for the audience. 
Um, the first is very simply that the company was also often a company out of control, which is that although there were MPs with uh, shares in the company who were living off money that they got from the company, you describe in the book how the director sometimes had no clue what was happening in communication, uh, the, the lapse in communication of six months perhaps for, for news right. to travel yeah. meant that sometimes these wars happened and ended and the loot was already divided before the directors heard and they were extremely angry often. So this very quickly develops a conflict of interest between the company, which wants to make the maximum amount of money for itself, and its individual servants. So if there is, the company keeps writing out saying, we can't afford these wars. Wars are expensive. All our money is going to buy, train up sepoys, to buy ammunition, to buy, build fortifications. We want a peaceable trade, they say. But if you're on the ground and you are a soldier, it's in your interest to provoke war. Because in the, in the mores of the times, if you fight, if you take a city by storm, you have the right to the prize. In other words, all the plunder that's gathered. And it's divided one-third to the general, one-third to the officers, one-third to the ordinary soldiers. So if you're a soldier in the East India Company army, the quickest way to make money is to fight a war. So you have this constant different to interest, and the company is trying to restrain the guys on the ground from conquering the Marathas or provoking a battle with Tipu Sultan. And the guys on the ground are desperate to provoke a battle and get their, share, get their hands on the loot of Sri Rangapatnam or whatever it is. And one of your ancestors came out and tried that and flopped massively. Well, several of my ancestors tried to shake the pagoda tree, as it was called. And uh, the, one, the first one out was Stair Dalrymple, who first of all invested in indigo. His ship sank. He got heavily in debt, and then he ended up in the black hole and died. So he didn't do very well. All right, the other quick question is, in 1780, there's this other stunning bit in the book where you talk about how the Indian armies of the Nizam, the uh, Tipu Sultan and the Marathas came that close, within an inch of actually pushing the, the East India Company out. And there again, they flopped in the last minute. So this is actually the most interesting thing of all, I think, probably, because the, um, yeah, by 1779, the Tipu has got all the tricks that the company has, socket bayonets, uh, artillery screws on the back of his artillery, uh, uh, canister shot, grape shot, all the new innovations. And in 1779, the Marathas defeat the company outside Pune at Talgaon. Then in 1780, Tipu defeats the company at Polilor. And if only they had pushed, if they realized how weak the company was. Meanwhile, in Calcutta, Hastings has just fought a duel with Philip Francis and the civil war in the, the, the very top tier of government. And the company is bankrupt. So, uh, but Tipu does not take Madras. He could have taken Madras. And again, none of Fadnavis could have gone and taken Bombay, but they don't. It's just that hesitation. At that point, the company could have been finished, but they don't do it. But what's interesting is, and what's a very important thing, just like I think it's very important for the British to know which they don't, how much of their money came from looting this country. It's very important to emphasize here how much of the money of the company came, A, from Indian financiers, particularly the Mawaris, making, uh, uh, getting, because as far as the Mawaris were concerned, the company spoke the same language as them. They might be English, they might be meat-eating, heavy drinking, the opposite of good Jane bankers but they understood the same financial language. They understood about interest rates, repayment, repayment on time, contracts, commercial courts. And the company lures in the people of this country. Calcutta becomes like Dubai or Singapore today, a free trade port where there's no taxes. So if you want to make money and you don't, and you don't want to pay Mughal or, or, or the taxes in Jodhpur, you move your office to Calcutta, which is what the Mawaris do en masse. Likewise, they, they break up. The company in 1780 does something called the Permanent Settlement, which is an incredibly clever move because it basically breaks up these huge Mughal Jagirs which are given to one officer. And they put it up for auction. Who buys it? The Bengali Badralog, the Tagores, the Maliks, the Banerjees, the Chatterjees, and the Ghoshes. And they become part of the British system. They then offer high-interest bonds so that Bengalis can invest in the company. And they offer, you know, 100% return in five years. So you lend 100 rupees in 1790, you get 200 rupees back in 1795. So the money, the Bengalis are investing their own money in the company and allowing the company to, to... So that collaboration, which everyone knows about in this country, but which is never put in the textbooks, is a crucial part of the story. 
It's and funny, right? The company defeats Siraj Dola, but his own mother has business dealings in, in Calcutta. Exactly. All right, we'll open up for questions now. Uh, there's a gentleman there. William, Hello, sir. William, congratulations on your presentation. Thank you, sir. And I'm glad you're better. Now, I just want to, uh, to request you to, could you provide a timeline between the Dutch VOC and the East India Company did, when did they have a head-to-head -head on call, uh, confrontation? So, the, there are a selection of, I think, five rival Dutch companies that get onto the spice trade in the 1590s. The company launches in 1599 and sends its first expedition in 1601. While the company is sailing, the Dutch, realizing the threat from England, unite the different companies and form the VOC, the United Dutch East India Company, which is founded in 1602, three years after the East India Company. So there are Dutch companies that precede the East India Company, but the VOC comes later. And the VOC is incredibly powerful for about 30, 50, 70 years. Uh, but by the 1780s, the Dutch revolution in finance, all their innovations in financial methods, the, 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 a central bank is a Dutch invention, uh, various bond schemes, and, and these sort of financial instruments have spread through Europe, so Holland loses its primacy. And by 1700, this brief flourish in, in, in Holland is over. We'll go to the back for now. Uh, are there any ladies? With questions at the back, yes, there's someone in a red sweater there. You can stand up. Hi. Uh, how much of this um, the sort of heinous acts that were committed by the company uh, were justified in the name of free trade? Um, and also, how much backing did they have of the British government uh, in terms of even with the British Army or something like that? It's a very important question. So the answer is you never hear the phrase free trade at all at this period because the company is the opposite of free trade. The company is a monopoly, which is a very controversial thing even at the time. The company gets its monopoly from the original charter in 1599, which also, incidentally, from the very first, authorizes it to wage war. So from the beginning, the idea is that you're going out with guns as well as with, with, with gold, uh, intenting on waging war as well as in trading. As far as the government is concerned, the government does not get involved at all until 1774. From the, the first, from 1599 to 1774, this is the world's most libertarian capitalist entity. There is no government overlooking it. And the government is very happy to let it get on with what it's doing. A, it doesn't know what it's doing because it's the overseas, it's far away. There are no British embassies in those days or anything like that. The company runs itself in India and no one's looking. And the company, the country gains from this because it, the company provides, I think it's a third of British taxes and half of British income tax. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, so 1774 you get the beginnings of state intervention and by 1858 you get the full nationalization and the beginning of the Raj with the, with the country. But free trade is the rhetoric of the 19th century. It's not the rhetoric of this period. All right, we'll come up front now. There's a lady here. Good morning, sir. Uh, in India, Chaltery Court established from the Charter of 1726. Is East India Company interference in court proceedings also? Court proceedings also? Is East India Company interfere in court proceedings also? So the company has its own courts here. One of the things it also has, as well as the right to wage war, is the right to set up courts. This first charter given by Elizabeth in 1599 at a time when no one even knows where, you know, where the East Indies are. There's very little actual detailed data on any of this part of the world in England. At that point, the rights are given to wage war, to set up courts, to found colonies. All these things are in that original charter. So the company has its own legal system. And it's only, I think, in 1780 with Warren Hastings that you get the first um, sort of national judges imported uh, to Calcutta f to, um, to do justice for the British inhabitants. Uh, but what you do get from the beginning is the company bribing and interfering in Parliament. 
Uh, and the idea that the company bribes Parliament becomes so widespread that by the 1770s, a quarter of the parliamentarians are ex-East India Company men. And 40% of Parliament has East India Company shares. So the, the Parliament, in a sense, is, does not interfere with the monopoly and the vast privileges of the company because they all stand to become rich from it. Uh, there's a gentleman in the brown jacket there. If you'll stand up. We need it. Wait till you get a, uh, a microphone. Is this the right? Can Actually, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. A large one line. Uh, your one line lesson for the Indian Republic from the present, past history. One line lesson. Well, I think there's no. I mean, the, the big lesson in the sense today is the power of corporations. Ask yourself, would the current government have come to power without the donations of the Adanis, the Tatars, uh, and Reliance? <laughs> a, a large part of what was looted by the East India Company found its way into the coffers of the British government. And that contributed in a very measurable way to the impoverishment of India. So don't you think... There is a duty and an obligation which is cast even on today's UK government to make, to make reparations to the poorest of India's poor. So, the problem you have at the moment is that none of this has been taught in British schools for 30 years. The British are unbelievably ignorant about their own imperial history. My kids went from studying the Tudors to studying um, the, the Nazis, World War II, with a brief stop-off uh, where the British liberate and um, end the slave trade. So the impression is given that British history is one long march towards uh, anti-racism and, uh, and liberty. Uh, and I mean, I'm not joking. This is a real problem because, I mean, you see generations of well-meaning British ambassadors and politicians coming out to India, assuming that we're all the best friends, that you know, we all had a lovely time together. We gave you Edwina Mountbatten. It was all absolutely fantastic. You know, it's all one long Sunday night story of uh, a movie about you know, similar croquet parties and merchant ivory elephants swishing their tails and Maharajas gratefully bowing before the Latsab. And there is simply no understanding at all about what British imperial history meant not just for India, but even for Ireland, for Africa, for you know, the, 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 the whole story of the slave trade. So I, I wouldn't disagree with anything that you're saying, but there, we are miles from there yet. First of all, we need to get this in the, in the curriculum. We need it to get taught. We need people to understand this. We need some telly out there where someone like Shashi's up there ranting and, and uh, <laughs> doing the Shashi thing. I mean, and this, you know, only then can these later come, you know, the contents of museums, the, you know, whether is everything loot in the, you know, in the British Library or is, you know, archaeological excavations that were discovered, is that different from something actually taken from Sri Ranga Putnam at the point of a bayonet? All these discussions can open up after people understand for the first time what has happened. But there is, I mean, it'll sound ridiculous to every person in this audience, but when the Brexit vote happened, the first thing Theresa May did was to take a delegation of British businessmen out to India. And the idea was that having, having fallen out with all our friends in Europe, we would just go back to the colonies where we would be openly embraced with an open arms and all our old friends would be waiting for us. And it was literally called, I'm not joking, it was literally called by the civil service Empire 2.0. <laughs> the lady here. Um, uh, while all this was happening, you did have the William Bentings and you did have utilitarianism and cutting of military expenditures. So surely it wasn't across the board till 1857. Can you address that? Too? So, yes, you're quite right. My book ends in 1803. The anarchy uh, is, is sort of 1599 to 1803. You, from that point in 1774, when the, the government begins to get involved, you then get British government appointed governor generals like Bentick. And so you get this drift into a public-private partnership that takes place before the national, formal nationalization. But that's outside the, the purview of this, of this book. 
All right, I've been very ageist lately. There's two very young people here. The, the gentleman here in the grey coat. And then there's a striped t-shirt over there. If you can ask your questions together quickly, William will answer them one after the other. Because we're done, sadly, with the time. Hi. Um, my question is a very short one. To what extent does the company's conquest support the argument of economism in history? And say, how does that apply? Say that again, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. To what extent does the company's conquest uh, support the argument of economism in history and how does that apply to the political context? How, the idea that, that uh, finance rules... Uh, so, I mean, I think my personal view is that, you know, history is formed both by personalities and by economic forces. I don't think you can explain the rise of Modi only by looking at economic forces. The fact that he's such an incredibly dominant personality plays a part. Personalities do affect history. But the wider currents of economics... So I, I always try in my books, in a sense, to find, a, find a, a midway point between the Marxist idea that everything is, is, is invisible economic forces which we can't see but which alters everything we do, and the old sort of Victorian idea that history is formed by great men and a single charismatic individual can, can change the, the, the course of history. We know from our own times that both are true. That, you know, the collapse of the economy will affect the Modi government, but Modi's charisma, whether we like it or not, will also, you know, be a balancing factor. Uh, and these, you know, it is, it is the interplay of all these things that results in, 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 which, in the way history is made. All right, let's try to short quickly. Um, good morning. My question is a short one. So, just has how you mentioned that the East India Company was a multinational corporation. It focused mainly on India. Was there a similar corporation operating in the West as well? Like, for example, say the colonies and... Was it completely the British government or was there some sort of a multinational corporation? So there were many other corporations. The East India Company was, we, was the one that was most successful by a long way. But before it, there's the Muscovy Company, which is founded in 1550, which is the business model that Smythe, the Vijay Malia character, follows when he f starts the company. There's a the Royal Africa Company, which is involved in the slave trade. Uh, and there's little companies that, f that open up areas of North America. So there's a Rhode Island Company. And the only one that's still going and is still in business today is the Hudson Bay Company. All right, thank you very much. We're sadly out of time. And I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, William. And he'll be signing books and you can go pick up copies from the bookstore. And to think he wasn't even feeling 100%. Thank you so much to William Dalrymple for that uh, luminous talk. And thanks also to Manu S. Pile for the, facilitating the Q&A. That session was presented to you by Avid Learning. William will be signing books. So you can go and pick up a copy of The Anarchy at the JCB Prize for Literature Bookshop. You'll find that next to the Charbag venue on the left-hand side. You can pick up a copy of The Anarchy there. William Dalrymple will be signing copies. You'll find him in the Z kiosk. So you will, in fact, have to come back to this venue to the next front lawn. You'll find the author signing area in the Z kiosk in the far right corner of this venue. The next session coming up here at 12.30 in 15 minutes is Poor Economics, Fighting Global Poverty. That session is with Abhijit V. Banerjee in conversation with Srinivasan Jain. It is presented by the Aga Khan Foundation. Please stay with us. It'll start in 15 minutes. And if you are leaving the premises, I'll ask you to please exit quickly. Make sure you take all your belongings.